their connection was the Victor Bruin office because Jerry had worked for the Bruin office in Detroit and presented with the opportunity, she came to LA to work in Bruin's office in Los Angeles. And Elsie was very um, familiar with Victor since she had been married to him and had worked in the, the Bruin office. Um, so she introduced Jerry to Eudora and their friendships, you know, Solidified. And when Jerry found out that Eudora was developing this exhibition, Islands in the Land, she said, quote, I'm desperately interested um, in doing the exhibition design because Jerry felt she had a terrific familiarity with the material as well as the sympathy for it, having grown up in the South, being from Memphis, where you're, you are surrounded by much more traditional crafts, I think, than, than you are here in Los Angeles, which people say is a city with no history, although we would argue with them. So as history has revealed, Jared did get the job as the installation designer, and um, Yudi provided the framework and the support to make this exhibition in 1971 at the Pasadena Art Museum, one of the most compelling, engaging, and most popular and beloved of the exhibitions at the museum. So um, I am not going to belabor. I'm going to let Jerry do that. So thank you and, and welcome Jerry. I brought with me, which is in my archives, the uh, LA Times uh, magazine section on Home Sweet Home. I'll let people come up and look at it on the desk, but it is not to be passed around because it is too fragile. Most of the photographs in here, all of them are done by Richard Gross. And also, this was the uh, review by Bill Wilson, which could not have been nicer than what he did. And it was particularly interesting because there was such a bias at that time from the East Coast towards anything happening out here. Um, I had a fabulous time with doing it for beauty because I spent 10 days at their house because she wouldn't let me go back to the west side of town every night and I didn't want to either. So I stayed at the house and got up every morning and we tripped over to the museum. The thing that was so interesting about it, which really connects with Judy, is that she drew in all of her friends in the Pasadena area. And I met some of them, like Lois Boardman, who has become a friend of mine, and Ralph Nassara. And all these people volunteered to help do this exhibition. It was 13,000 square feet and over well, some say it was 1,000 objects, and somebody else says it was 3,000 objects. And to put that exhibition together in 10 days was oh. really a miracle. <laughs> and everybody clamored to work on it. And there was a lot of it. There was uh, Ralph, no, Frank Romero worked on it. Mm. Uh, Park Meeks, who was really the glue of the Ames office, and I would say to Park, now I want something about this high, and I want to be able to put hats on it. Would you make something? And so maybe an hour or two hours later, he'd come back and he'd have this thing all made. He says, is this what you want? Yes, and I want six of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very, very thrilling time in an exhibition like that. It was the first time that storyteller dolls were ever shown in this country. And the history of the storyteller dolls from one of the Pueblos, I forgot which one it was, that was south of Santa Fe, were really a, a very early invention of what, you, what we would call today as folk art. Um, and it was all because of one grandpa, and he was always telling stories to his grandchildren that were always crawling all over him. So he developed the storyteller doll. And there was quite a few of them. And I have a friend who has the largest collection of storytellers in the United States. But 
the interesting thing about that is that you always think of folk art being something that's way, way back. But it wasn't. It's always continuing. It's always developing. <coughs> and it took somebody like Judy to spot that and put it in the exhibition. The other thing that Judy did, and I don't know whether I mentioned it, she got all of her friends to bring in either lunch or dinner for all of us so we couldn't go out. We were completely locked. <laughs> I, I don't know of another museum in town that would, would pull that off. <laughs> so there were a whole lot of things that were very, very important about that show. Also, one of them, I don't know where it is right now, is um, it's a, that we, these were to be like freeway signs directing you in. Um, there was uh, several of the people, folk artists, how come it's not going? See, these are the two islands in Hawaii. This is the Pueblos and the River, and this was Appalachia. These were the objects. Some of the objects came from the Smithsonian, and some of them were from Beauty, just her collecting, and Rennie was with her a lot on these collecting exhibitions. And I hope Rennie will eventually tell the story about the pocket knife, because I love that story. Uh, this is a lady who made baskets, out this. There's a larger picture of her. Brooms. Uh, I guess this is more basket. I don't remember this one. And these are, oh, these are all Richard Gross's, which he did on a trip. Were you with him, Rennie? No, I'm sorry. When your mom did that? And that one, Richard. Was okay. Here. These are some of the people and some of the objects. Now, these murals here, uh, were photographs, and today you cannot even get those because there is not paper large enough to print them. And there was only one man in town, and I can't think of the same right now who was able to print them. They were eventually auctioned off. Um, these are some of the Cherokee baskets. Uh, these are some of the other baskets. The plot of baskets from Appalachia and all in. Oh, and this is really, really very fun. You see this here? This is a banjo, but it was made from a car distributor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that was pretty ingenious. Also, all the crates uh, for the exhibition. I called up a, air, a airline transportation <coughs> shipping company, and they made all these crates in the parking lot of the Pasadena Museum for us. And this was going up of all the chairs. This was on the Appalachian side, the whole collection of chairs. And this is where Rennie will tell his story eventually about the chair. And we wrapped all the walls in the parking lot. And on one side, That's me, <laughs> my wonder red hat, that the lady made a principal she made a rug out of the, the wonder red afterwards. And then I asked her later on to do one for me. And I still have, I really should have worn it today, but I just didn't think. Um, these are all corn themselves from Appalachia. Quilts, a lot of quilts. This is the entrance. This is one of the major pueblos. Up on, this is a town's pueblo. These are all different objects that were made there. I'm really hoping to get one in here of the exhibition down at that area. And this on, on, the, on the pueblos of the Rio, Rio Grande, the cardboard was all cut in the shape of fallen adobes. Uh, these right here were the uh, people who made different objects, and they were on cardboard blocks. Uh, Marion Sampler, who was the graphic designer at Victor Gruen, was the only one allowed to, to handle the uh, Indian pots, because he was an Indian pot collector. And, uh, 
Mire was one of my favorite people, gentleman of color, but oh, what a guy. Oh, this one here, Frank Romero did the, all the painting. And the thing that was so much fun about it is that a lot of the people from the Pueblos came to see the exhibition. And the door handle and the hinges on this were by a certain uh, Indian family. And it happened to be this painting was their house. So here was the ironwork, the metalwork on their own painting of their own house, which I love that. And then this was Mr. Archuleta, who Yudi called the Picasso of the folk art world. And, but Mr. Archuleta was really an old lecture that I remember <laughs> Because I visited him when I was in the on the below part of the place and we were a friend of two years. He was really something else. See, these are some of the pots that are in, installed. And these are some of the storyteller dolls. And this is a very old pot. So there was old pots, new pots, old baskets, new baskets, everything in the show. And this, I love this piece. You will, bet you all can't guess what it is. Pam can. Huh? Pam can? Yes, you got it. But these tennis shoes are really, in fact, John McLean is in the back family in this place in Portland, Oregon. I guess these, no, these were, the piece came from one of the Pueblos. Uh, it was a really exciting exhibition to do. And then, I have to say, Egotistically, I think it's one of the best exhibitions, best things I ever did. And it was so much fun to have Beauty and all of her friends being involved in the whole situation. And uh, I, I don't know of another exhibition that was ever pulled off in the same way. And then there was a sale afterwards of the things that could be sold. And I got a few of them, and I think probably some people in here got a few of them too. But it will always be memorable and will be in my own archives of all the songs. Anybody have any questions? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. What did you Dora do? You Dora? What did you everything. do? Yes. Oh Tell us. She was the one who collected everything. She was the one who went around the country and got all the pieces. I didn't do it. <laughs> well, perhaps I should say, I didn't want Jerry to be standing up there while I gave you a long-winded explanation, but this show is a tribute to Eudora and Moore and her legacy as being the catalyst and the muse for the craft and design world from the moment she stepped forward in 1962 and was made curator of design at the Pasadena Art Museum. So when we are finished, we will be collecting the chairs, turning on the lights, and you'll be able to go through the exhibition. Uh, it's some photo documentation, uh, some objects that were from the actual shows that Eudora oversaw, which were the California design exhibitions from 1962 on to the last one, which is was California Design 76. And um, there is uh, homage to her for the book that she came up with the idea, The Craftsman's Lifestyle, The Gentle Revolution, talking about the way in which craftspeople have a, a conscious and chosen lifestyle when they choose to be craftspeople. Um, and then there are some uh, ephemera materials to talk about Eudora's many, many uh, awards that she um, received in her lifetime, including one as a living treasure by the state of California when they were awarding living treasures. And other um, important people in dignitaries such as Sam Maluth and Beatrice Wood and Arlene Fish were also given uh, California Living Treasure Awards, but to my knowledge, Eudora was the only non-artist to receive one, so that's quite uh, an accolade. And, and there is the catalogs of Islands and Land, as well as the other catalogs for all the shows that Eudora did. California Design 1910, an absolutely landmark exhibition 
that was the first to document with great scholarship the Californians' response to the arts and crafts movement from 1885 through 1920. So, I mean, there are so many memories in this room of what Eudora accomplished in, you know, a, a long and rich life, but at every step, Eudora was always a step ahead. And I feel like now we still can't catch up with her. Um, so we will, you know, give oh, you that opportunity. Oh, we have a conversation, but Eudora was always a step ahead. And even my last conversation with her, which was just a few weeks ago, but she, her mind was always a step ahead. And she knew how to knit things together. She knew how to knit ideas together. People can have ideas, but they don't know how to knit them together. And my good fact is an extremely inter interesting kind of talent. And in answer, Carol, to your question, yes. not a single show that she did that she did not select everything for. And the whole concept was always used. So and when you were a big thing. And when you were in the museum and setting up the exhibition, was she entering the objects? Was she were you going to her for advice? Was she giving you advice no, without I, No. Uh -uh. She was the biggest support. This is what you want, Jerry, you'll get it. That basically what it was. It wasn't said that way, but that's what happened. And also the support of all the other people that we were able to gather to come and help us, helped us accomplish that. Even to, like, about 20 minutes before the opening, she was, and all of us were still putting things together. And it was a very, very big smashing opening and a big no. Thank you. Anybody else like this was the announcement poster for it. This was the mailer. I'll pass that because I've got more of that for real. Um, and how was the show received? Huh? How was the show received? It was received tremendously received. The only problem was at that particular time is that the East Coast still thought we were next to China. <laughs> and I can tell you some loads of stories about that because at the same time there was a big show at uh, Whitney in New York which got all the coverage, uh, which, you know, didn't set very well, but, you know, it's still a little bit that way today that we're still next to China. Only, as I said in an article several years ago, when uh, Bill Hamilton came out to do, which was based on really Uni's work, and it was called The Endless Summer of Design, being California. And he came to interview me, and I said, well, it's very simple, Bill. If Columbus had discovered California, there'd be no East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, because the weather, the situation, the climate, and attitude. This is the catalog that Beauty put out. Um, this is also the not book. Yeah. Who came up with the name? Who came up with the name Islands of the Oh, she did. I mean, anything that was connected to an exhibition was Beauty's, not somebody else's saying, oh, I've got an idea for your Beauty. That didn't work that way. Uh, because her ideas, everybody clamored to be a part of them. It wasn't somebody coming ahead and saying, well, I've got an idea for you. But it just didn't work that way. And that was not from a selfish or dogmatic standpoint. It's because she had the spark and she had the light to pursue that. And she came up with it. And it was very, very fetching. You know, she said, oh, golly, I want to be part of that. And there were so many people. Tom, are you going to say something? Sure. How new was the building at that time? Um, like it was mid <laughs> midway. It wasn't really because it was one of the veins of the doing the exhibition was the lighting, because the amount of money that was spent on the lighting really wasn't adequate enough. 
So it hadn't actually opened yet? Oh, no, it had opened and it had many exhibitions going. But it was also in that very squeamish time when the museum was on its legs. Mm -hmm. you know, this is before, Nor just before Norton Simon bought it, but there was a lot of skullduggery happening at the time. That's the only way I can express it, skullduggery. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the major exhibition. In the, it looks like it took up the whole building, yes? Well, we took up one side of the whole building, and that was 13,000 square feet, which is an awful lot of yeah. footage to do. Yeah. 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 But it was in that period where it was very touch and go. And a lot of stuff happened. But a lot of people don't realize, too, that the museum was first started in the Moore's living room. The Pasadena Museum was the meeting that was started by Union Anson in her in their living room. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is it too personal of a question to ask? How does, some, how does a show like that get financed? Well, she was very clever about that. So she knew. There was like Broadway department store was one of her big supporters. Um, and she was also able to get some state funds and she was also able to get some funds from the city. And Rennie could probably even tell you more about that than I. Funding was actually something that she was very adept at, particularly when it came to the uh, California design catalogs because they had a lot of commercial objects and so the companies like Robinson and uh, 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 had an interest in supporting that and so she was um, she was very about the making relations with the heads of those companies and um, so it's very easy to get support for those and that's why you see catalogs for all of those shows. This show was different because it was folk art. This was a real challenge, and that is why there is no catalog for this show. I mean, it has a, you know, it's just tuck, um, but no book uh, Which is part of the reason why we wanted to display these objects and, and um, have this uh, little photo uh, exhibition, was because that was one of the things that in her career that she felt uh, was missing, was that there was no catalog, because in her mind, what made it real was the catalog, because the catalog had a life that went on forever. And this show, which she loved, didn't have that. So, anyway, so the funding was, was challenging for this show, but not so much for um, the uh, contemporary California design show. But they, she always was, Eudora was always looking for funding sources for the next show and the next show. And it, she says in her interview with UCLA that the reason they had the auction at the end of Islands in the Land was to raise money for the next California Design Exhibition. All that money went back into supporting the next show. But they also did other really inventive things to raise money. And, um, Lois Gordon, who's not here this evening, but she told me that the during the programming, uh, they had a pit firing with uh, Maria Martinez and Adam and Santana, the, the son and daughter. And the fire department agreed to allow them to do the pit firing on the grounds of the Pasadena Art Museum as long as they could fly a helicopter overhead while they were doing it. And that's um, exactly what they did. So the whole time they did the pit firing with the uh, Native American Indians and everybody that they got to you know, join in at the museum, you get the whirl of the uh, helicopter above. <laughs> the, the other thing that w was done that was really amazing, and you were probably there to talk about it, was that they did a authentic, or near to authentic dinner, a Cherokee dinner. And the, Lois said that she had to somewhat amend the recipe because it called for taking a pot of boiling water and putting your squirrel in it, 
and then taking his skin off. And she said she didn't think that the gentle folk of Pasadena could abide <laughs> that. Although, you know, you throw a lobster in there, so not much, a little different. So, were you there? You want to talk about that? No, I don't think All right. So, Lois <laughs> went. I didn't mean squirrel. Lois went and researched. Uh, apparently, there was a, a, a cookbook out at the time about Cherokee cooking, and it was as near to as possible. And, and there were 200 people who attended. And you know, if you multiply that out by the really price of admission, that was another great way to fundraise. And it was also very relevant to the show. And I mean, it wasn't just about doing the exhibition for you, Dora. You said it was also the, the cataloging and you know, documenting and these wonderful programs. And then working with the high school and elementary schools in the area, which they did, uh, Eudora and Lois, and anybody else who was involved in that, to have this wonderful interchange where the museum would do a show and then they would prepare um, a slide, a film strips, it was film strips then, with a script, and they would have craft artists write the various scripts. So if you wanted to give a, a, a talk on baskets, there would have a basket maker do the, the text for you. And that would circulate through all of the um, Los Angeles City School Districts and Pasadena, too. I, so. I would like to add to this, not Island to the Land, but the California design shows, which were about every two years. There was always a buzz in this town that the California design uh, expeditions were coming, and people came to those in droves. And I think it's time that we had another major California but there was always a buzz in this town for those shows. Are there any other questions? There is a buzz now. <laughs> <laughs> there should be, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of stuff that's happening mm -hmm. in town right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's hellish to make it just mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, maybe you mentioned it, I'm just saying it's late, but what, what, what are the term uh, islands? It actually came from a very well known, I can't think of his name. Harry McWilliams. Yeah, Harry McWilliams. Oh, that's what I would know the way. Right. Yeah. But she adapted that. Yeah. So, so I, and that's where it came from, Harry McWilliams. That's right. where I thought. Yeah. And she mentions that in her four. Well, and actually, in the article in the um, Home Magazine, she talks about mm -hmm. that. See, these were some of the pictures of Richard Gross. Um, the, it is practically a whole full issue of Tom Magazine, which is no longer connected or even at the LA Times. But it was a big supporter of not only this show, but a lot of the other shows. And I see Jim Aaron back there who did a major show with his daughter. Um, uh, I was on but the you know him, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you were in California, right? So, why did I do that? I'm like six, Dad. Tell them about it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Tell I said, them. tell about oh. the show oh. you oh. did. Oh. I, I, worked on the, I worked on the show, um, California Enjoy 1910, because I'm a big collector of all that for all that stuff. The, well, the tell dirt them what your stuff was. Dirt yes. Yes. Oh, dirt banner of lamps and pots that were made in California. Like, oh, yeah. California fans. California fans. What's that one yes. from the, no, up north? Grand, no. Wait a minute. There, I, so I, were, I, I was drawn into that. So that's when I got to know you, you very well. At that point. And that was a very fun show. It was green and green furniture in it. And green. There it is. <laughs> and I also. This is now a collector's item. <laughs> and I also worked. I don't know if we were. Victor Gruen at the same time. Were we here? Hmm? Were we? Uh, no, no, we're never. Because I knew I worked for Marion Sampler. Well, you worked with Marion Sampler, but I had left with oh, a long time she left before yeah, that. Before it was exactly. actually uh, just before I did my in the land. I was not connected with Gruen. That's when I was sharing space with Frank Gehry, Greg Walsh, oh, yeah. and John Chadwick. Well, anyway, the, the, the California Design 1910 was. This is a very nice exhibition. It was really very fun. nice. Catalog. And you should look through it because probably I'm credited with loaning some of the stuff. <laughs> um, I would say yes. Yeah. And, and also, um, Emily 
um, here as director of the center just mentioned it might be a great at the end or if there's not enough time privately to come up and tell us what your connection was with Eudora because we would, there is going to be a website hopefully devoted to Eudora more and her work, her legacy, her career. Well, I think we really should go first. Well, she, well, of course, I meant at the end. Okay. But the end always means when the foundation okay. starts. Right. <laughs> um, so, and, and we would love to know your contact information and if you'd like to share your story because then, you know, we, we could put it on the website at some point or what, however it you know, could be useful to our research. So are you, are you ready to, no, see, you're not quite ready. Yeah. I just want to add that in the design catalog, so the photography is really spectacular. I mean, a lot of the large pieces are out in the middle of the desert. A lot of that was Richard Groves. So, um, there are many amazing firsts that Jerry's talked about that uh, Mom established, but one of them was creating an atmosphere for all of the objects. So rather than, as with every other show in the past, you saw an object in a studio. She looked at it and she said, because she had this. Ray, you want to stand up so Victor will Well, I didn't want to. Well, no, that you, you know, this is a perfect offer. This is Fred Moore. This Doug's son of Eudora Moore was agreed to give us a background information for how it was growing up with such a legendary person. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about the um, what it was like growing up with her, and, and um, uh, my mom was a trip, <laughs> figuratively and literally. Um, what an amazing woman! And uh, I was just thinking, as Joe and Carol asked me to to talk about her, what it was like growing up with her, and so on. And started thinking about that. And, um, uh, it made me realize, as I thought about her and her career, because I knew her as a mom, um, but what I realized is that uh, many of the, th the things that made her such a great mom made her just an amazing person for what she did. And, um, but, you know, one of the things that has been noted in the past is that she was not professionally trained for what she ended up doing with her career. <laughs> she was a zoology major who got married two weeks after she graduated. She was going into medical, uh, her plan was to go to medical school before she got engaged to my dad. And um, so she was a housewife. And for 15 years, she was a housewife, a mother, and uh, a volunteer. So her entree into the whole art world was one through the side door. And to Jerry's point, what um, in fact, actually it was her non-academic credentials that I think, uh, along with her philosophy about life, that really made her the extraordinary human being that we all remember. And so, this was, the things that I wanted to talk to you about are some of the stories. And the way I thought I'd approach the story was talking about some of the attributes that I remember about my mom. And one of those was that she was an incredible adventurer. Um, it's, there, it just seemed like there wasn't a time in my life where we weren't traveling, or she wasn't going to somewhere. Not um, so, not, not Paris, but she would go to these very rugged places. And, and just recently, um, she told me this story within the last year about how she uh, learned to drive at age 14. She lived in Denver, Colorado. And she had this uh, cabin that we went to, that I went to, have gone to my whole life every year in the summer. And this was such a special place to her that uh, beginning when she could drive, that she, um, at age 14, she would drive to this place 
which is now about a four hour drive from Denver into Gunnison, which is in, on the western slope of Colorado. So it's not a long haul now, but back then, in 1930, which 32, which is when she was 14, she would just drive alone to get to this cabin, which was at 10,000 feet. And the only thing there, other than the beauty of being in this valley and these mountains, uh, of 13,000 feet, um, were miners, because her grandfather was a gold miner, a gold mine operator. And this place, though, was so special to her and gave her so much joy that it was worth it to her to drive alone at age 14 to get there. And I just can't imagine a more adventurous person than my mom. Um, there was really no place too rugged. She, uh, I camped with her. The, the funny thing is we talk about all of these things. I actually have great memories of them, but my real memories were of the times that we would spend together camping and, and um, just being together at, in Pasadena. And uh, so I don't know how she was able to fit it all in that. But um, she was both an adventurer uh, in the physical world, but she was also an incredible adventurer intellectually. Um, and I think that has come out in some of the things that Jerry has talked about. But another attribute that I would um, bring up is incredible optimism. I've just met, never met somebody who was so positive. And she just carried that throughout her life and saw the world as one of abundance and not scarcity. It was just a wonderful thing to be raised in that world. Uh, she had an incredible belief in herself and her vision, like nobody's business. Um, and there was this feeling that if you were with her, that whatever you were doing was right and was going to turn out great. And um, we, I have so many stories, but one story is uh, one of the many, many, many times that we went camping in Baja. Um, we were, went way down into this remote area called the Laguna Salada, which is uh, just, um, it's about 100 miles south of the border, very desolate, and we would go down there, and then there was this um, almost oasis-like place where there was uh, cold water uh, streams and hot uh, spa, and it, and it was owned by this Mexican family, and we would go down there two or three times a year. Um, but this one time, we traveled way, way down further and into this Laguna Salada and in our Ford Country Squire. And the only other cars that we saw were four by fours. There was nobody who would dare take a station when get down there. And we would be down there with my friends, my brother and his friends, and my dad and mom, and my dog. And so uh, then we would camp in these this army tent, this big army tent. And she would be the first one up in the morning making breakfast. And, um, anyway, so we had this, this wonderful time, and I remember we were driving out, and um, we got stuck in the sand, so we had to uh, unload everything oh, yes. and jack the car up, and we realized that it was, we couldn't do it, so we uh, take care of the car, it was getting dark, so we, we decided to camp another night, and we took care of it in the morning, got everything, got the car out of the, the sand, and, and drove on, and, and then we were finally on the road, and, um, suddenly, the car stopped, and there was, uh, we had a broken um, radiator hose, and there we were, out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so, what were, what were we going to do? I, I said, um, you know, I think, I think I have some duct tape. And so, I looked back, and I found some duct tape, and I got out of the car, and wrapped the hose in duct tape, and and we went on our merry way. And that was kind of the way it was with her. It's whatever we did, it was all work out just fine. <laughs> so, um, I would say uh, some other uh, characteristics. She's very gracious and grateful. Um, that was just 
the way she lived her life. She was extremely high in energy. This is a person I don't remember being sick, uh, except once, one time, she had the flu, which laid her up for a couple of days. But other than that, I never saw her lie down, except when she went to bed. Um, but always moving, always thinking, always doing. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, what an individualist. Um, she is the very definition of rugged individualist. Um, whether it was uh, camping uh, in a rainstorm at 13,000 feet in Colorado, or whether it was battling the boards of the Pasadena Art Museum, <laughs> she was an independent in every form of the word. Um, open and inclusive. Always open to new ideas. One of the things that made it so wonderful to be around her is that it really, you know, she never closed off anything in that is any possibilities. She was always open and always inclusive. So everybody was part of the embrace. Um, and uh, she was always interested in new ideas, a voracious reader. Um, we have. Uh, at her house, just an enormous library. She was always reading. Um, but she was also an amazing listener. Uh, you could tell her things, um, and uh, she could remember it in detail. Two years later, just amazing listener. Um, and she was never bound by any kind of shackles of, of of the rigidity or boundaries in the way that she thought about things. Uh, and it never mattered um, who, it doesn't matter who you were, it was always about the journey. So it didn't matter what your station was in life or whatever, that, that was just not a part of the way that she saw the world. It was always about you and your journey. And your journey, no matter who you were, you were faced with challenges and choices and that helped to define you and that was who she would uh, seek to find and to know. Um, when it came to process, process was everything um, when it came to design. And uh, it was never about the object. It was always about the process and the journey. And the object was really about the intersection of the process and the journey. Um, so. We had objects, in fact, all of these came from her house. Um, and except for a few items, they weren't displayed in any kind of, you know, way like this. They were just put in a place where she could see them and enjoy them. Because for her, they were a story. It was not just the beauty the aesthetics of that object. It was the relation that she had with the person who created it and the story behind the creation of that object. Um, you felt like you were the only one who existed. Mm -hmm. It mattered at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a very precious gift. Um, but uh, the other thing is she would never look back. So I remember, you know, recently talking about the um, Pacific Standard Time show that was, you know, all here in Los Angeles, and, and um, she didn't really understand that, you know. And yet a lot of this was talking about you know, objects and things that she was very involved with. But her thing was always about the future and looking about what's coming. Um, so, um, two more things. One, one was she had a deep love and respect for, for nature and the natural systems. And uh, the, the, there's beauty and simplicity, and nature is kind of the ultimate in inspiration. So she had a, a lifelong love affair with her garden. So as much as people know her about you know, in the art world, the hearts, um, she's actually, uh, she was a founding member of the Pasadena uh, Garden Club. And um, when she wasn't working on design, backpacking and doing stuff with her 
kids, uh, she was out in the garden. Um, and finally, one of the things that I would remark in terms of when I think of her was community. She always brought people together. Jerry suggested that when it came to putting these shows together, it wasn't about her, it was about this community, the community of Pasadena, Los Angeles, the community of craftspeople, and all working together for a common cause. And um, so I think that these qualities and this philosophy are a great recipe for the career that she chose, she created. Um, and I have lots of stories, but the one that specifically Jerry asked me to talk to you about was the story about this chair. And um, one of the many trips that I did with my mom in my life. Special, I've heard it a thousand times. <laughs> Did she buy the chair from Wiley? Did well, in fact, actually, you know, uh, it was kind of an interesting story. So we actually, we, we, my mom, asked him if we could get a whole dining room set. Because mm -hmm. we had this uh, idea that um, this was going to be, at the, at the, this was one of the two end chairs that we wanted. And we were going to have six or ten, twelve or something um, other chairs. And uh, it ended up that he only needed three. So we got three chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You mentioned your dad. Could you say some more words about that? And Absolutely. what role he played yeah. in relation to this, uh, <laughs> this whirlwind of uh, activity? And well, you know, the, uh, you can't have your yin without your yang. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was absolutely, the, you know, he was the perfect compliment to my mom. Um, it, and I think the thing that made their relationship so amazing is that they both had a deep and profound respect for their unique gifts. And, you know, my mom knew that she was a challenge to be with. Uh, not for, because she was all about ideas and possibilities. And, you know, most people, I don't think, can really could really live with that. But um, my dad was an amazing adventurer, too. I think one of the things that we held in common was this real, uh, one, love for each other, but love of adventure, and the adventure of life, and the adventures that you can have of all kinds. And so uh, it's amazing that he was able to put up with it all, but he did it, he did it with a smile, and damn happy to Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, at one point, I belonged to the uh, Collectors Club at the Southwest Museum, and I talked to Judy about joining, and her answer was, I'm not a collector. It's, um, it's a good point. Uh, so, so one of the things, the Southwest Museum, it, it's, it's sort of interesting uh, that my parents ended up here in Southern California because my grandfather on my father's side, so my dad's dad, was, um, he lived in New York and he was a, a corporate lawyer. But one of the things that he did, his kind of hobby, was to support archaeologists. And he loved archaeological digs, and one of the um, digs that he sponsored was in New Mexico, and uh, that whole collection from that series of digs was given to the Southwest Museum, and um, so anyway, there was a connection there, but to your point about my mom uh, not being a collector, she wasn't, although we probably had the largest collection of yeah. baskets <laughs> in the world, uh, but she never looked at it that way. This was about things that interested her just purely for their own. Um, it wasn't about, you know, what can I do with them later? It was just, she just loved these pieces for the story, for the uh, design, for whatever it was. Um, but 
I think if you came, you know, if you looked at the things in, in the house that she had, it, we say this was not a collector's house. It was just a collection of things that she loved. I'd like to make one other comment. Um, I met somebody who knew the people that wrote the big book art throwing so bad. And what she told me is that when they went to collect stuff, they would insist upon getting them as gifts. And I, that is not a union board. No, um, I think that uh, almost everything that she got in her house were given to her, but not requested. They were simply given. So we do, you know, she had some. These message. people made it no, a no, no. point yep. that if they wanted to be included in these folk art books, that they had to give them to. No, so one of the things, uh, you know, about, again, kind of a first, or, or when I think about that is unique, these shows that she did, so uh, the California design shows, were a triennial exhibits in which. Um, what I guess historically people had done is they would send in a picture of the object, uh, but not with these shows. You would actually take and send your physical object. You would either bring it down personally, and there were two locations. One was the Brookside Museum, excuse me, the Brookside Park. Uh, do you remember what? The Horticultural Building. The Horticultural Building. So they had this space that they rented out uh, near the Rose Bowl. And um, so from Southern California, all the objects would be sent there, and then in Northern California, they would be sent to Sacramento. But she didn't feel that you could give the object justice if you just saw a picture. So they had to see a physical object. And it didn't matter what size it was. You'll look, one, one, another area that I just think is absolutely amazing when I think about these shows, if you look at the books, and you'll see that there, there's some very tiny jewelry but there's some enormous objects there. There are walls of ceramics that people would have to bring down to Brookside <laughs> in order for that to be juried by Bernard and my mom Rudy. and Rudy. Uh, that was how it was done. And I think that the end result speaks for itself because you have um, these shows that were <coughs> absolutely incredible in terms of not the, the, the breadth, but also the depth um, of the objects. The, the architectural scale of some of these uh, was unheard of. It just didn't have places for people to show this stuff. And I think you know, just really unique and you know, I don't know, this was uh, something that was really important to her that it had to be the physical object. Uh, scene in order to give work was there. In so, so, you know, for the shows here, she was wired. You know, she knew everybody, right? right? right. So, the, the islands and the land was different because of the fact that, um, particularly Appalachia, we, one of the things, um, just back a little bit, um, growing up, I would go to this cabin with her and her whole family in Colorado. We would drive between Los Angeles and Mountain Colorado, which is kind of the center of Colorado. And every time we would go, we would go a different route. And we would often go through Arizona and New Mexico and stop off at, at uh, various Hopi and Navajo reservations. So we kind of had some idea of what the folk art activity was going on. But Appalachia was totally the world park. And my mom's connection to Appalachia was um, she grew up, well, she grew up in Denver. Uh, her dad um, was a businessman, and he, at a certain point, he owned a town in Nashville. Uh, not, excuse me, in Tennessee. Doesn't everybody own a town? <laughs> owned a town in ten, uh, Tennessee. And um, so they spent uh, basically the winters in, um, and I can't remember the name of it, can you remember? No, anyway. I don't. So, um, she had a deep affiliation and connection with that part of the world. But when we actually uh, traveled to Appalachia, the only connection that I know of was um, Joan Watkins, who was the wife, and I don't know what her other affiliations were, but of, of um, the head of the Smithsonian. Hmm. 
and so I think that she had a lot of connections. But I think I, I remember kind of stopping in at, at you know the cafes and places and asking people, you know, who do you know who makes these you know, type of wow. chairs? And yeah. so it was pretty, pretty yeah. grassroots and yeah. or pretty low levels. Uh, we didn't have a, a network of connections. Yeah. Well, we, you can also talk to Red and Jerry afterwards. They'll be here. They won't be able to escape from you. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd turn it over to Carol Sovion for just a minute because it is Carol's Craft America Center, and she might want to say a few words about the evolution of, of the center here and how it is connected to the Craft in America office and the program. Go ahead. Oh, we left off. In regards to one of the things that we want to do um, is to create a website, um, and so we're in the process process of doing that through the Crafts in America. Um, and the website is going to be all about California design and my mom and, and a lot of the kind of the stories behind California design. But, but so right now there are catalogs that are out there, but they're not available anywhere. Um, even to buy, if you want to buy them. So what we're planning on doing is, is to, uh, and I think we've scanned them all at this point, so we will make them available at, on the website. Um, so all of the catalogs. And then we're going to put all of the pictures that we want. And we're going to take um, some, we're going to do some interviews with people like Jerry and Lewis Boardman and Bernard Kester and others. And um, we're going to document that information also on the website so that people will have um, a little bit of background about what was happening uh, during that time and what people were thinking and, and why these shows came about and what their value is. And, you know, we all, many of us went to the Pacific Standard Time. And those were, um, it's wonderful to see, but the stories of that time were um, extraordinary. And, and I'm looking forward to Bernard and Jerry's and Lewis's. Can I tell one last story? Mm -hmm. Please. Oh, it, it's something that really meant a lot to me, and I it really summed up Beauty's own character. I, uh, on a rainy day, slipped on some tile on the elbows, and I wound up in the hospital with a shattered ankle. And uh, that's another kind of long story with the doctor there at the next morning when I finally came to and they told me what had happened. I said, well, I have to call Beauty. And the nurse said, well, why do you have to call her? And I said, well, I have to call her because I have to tell her I can't come to her dinner party tomorrow night. <laughs> so I finally got something to get me to of my cocktail. <coughs> and I told her that I could sit in the hospital with a shattered ankle and I couldn't come. And she said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll come and get you and you'll stay with us. <laughs> I stayed with them for 10 days. Well, wow. That was pretty damn nice. <laughs> <laughs> I remember to do that. And I'll, wow. I'll never forget it. It just brings tears. It's another side of beauty mm -hmm. that most people don't know about. And I get it. That is it. It's a wonderful story. However, I will say it wasn't unique because um, uh, during the course of my life, um, we had any number of people who ended up living with us. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, um, good friends of ours, their house was being worked on, one of their eight kids, they had to figure out where to, where to put them for, I think it was three or four months. He came live with us, my cousins had come to, anyway, it was, it was this sort of, there was always this open door kind of policy. People were, oh yeah, and one of the things I remember is, is um, you know, I, I would come and, and uh, you know, it was just about dinner time and, and I would have, uh, a, you know, 10 friends or something. And, you know, it's like, okay, no problem. Come on and eat. And she'd just figure out a way to, to make it all work out. And, and uh, uh, just, uh, I, I just remember another story. Uh, we, we came back from Baja. We just had this terrific time down in Baja. And, um, we arrived back and um, at the house, and there were this big group of people waiting there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, apparently, 
my mom had volunteered her house for this party that she totally forgot about. <laughs> and so she scrambled around and said, oh, no problem, we'll just make it all work out. And anyway, so it was just one of those things. She you know, just came back from Baja, which is a place where you get so dirty that it takes you a month to get the dirt out from under your fingernails. And she said, no problem, we're just going to make it all work out, it'll be great. And somehow she, she did. And that was kind of how things work. It was always a, 